Hello, my name is Roger Kershaw and I work at the National Archives and today I'm going to give a webinar on emigration records held by the National Archives. I'll be talking for about 20 to 30 minutes uh, and really just giving you an introduction to some of those main series relating to the probably 15 to 20 million individuals who left the British Isles between the 1700s and the late 20th century. So what am I going to cover? I'm going to cover records relating to passports and licenses to travel beyond the seas. Uh, these records were issued uh, to enable and give people the authority uh, to actually travel. Secondly, we're going to look at passenger lists because these physically record the exit of people leaving one country to another. I'm then going to talk to you about the various schemes that the UK government uh, offered emigrants uh, or free migrants. So they would provide incentives for people to leave the British Isles to move to the colonies and dominions to help develop those lands. And finally, I'll talk to you a little bit about child migration, uh, something very unique to Britain, uh, where the authorities promoted the migration of pauper children from the 1870s right through to the 1970s. I think one of the important things to note is that uh, these records relate very much to records held by the National Archives, so they're records created by government. And what I can do is just uh, emphasise this point by just telling you exactly who the National Archives are. We are the archives for England, Wales and the United Kingdom, so we hold records created by government. An awful lot of records relating to emigrants were created by private bodies, and we, we simply do not hold those. Again, we only hold those records created by governments, which were then selected to be permanent archives, so pr preserved permanently. Uh, and I'm sure, as you'll discover later on in this webinar, an awful lot of records created by government were destroyed under statute when they became no longer of a business uh, or purpose uh, need. So we're located here at Kew. Uh, we're open between Tuesdays and Saturdays from 9 to 5 o'clock, with late evenings to 7 o'clock on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Some of the records I talk about will not be online, so they won't have been digitised, and you will need to consider coming here to view them. And you can go to our website, and that explains whether you need to bring with you some forms of identification in order to get a reader's ticket. So it's really important you plan your visit very carefully. We also offer paid research for people who would like find it difficult to come to queue. And there's the front page of our website. I'm going to be talking to you about our catalogue discovery, uh, but also about using our research guides. Research guides tend to help jumpstart people's research, so they take you from a research guide, which may talk about collections of records, into the catalogue, which will then help you identify the records you need to look at and in some cases it will then allow you to download those records if they've been digitized. So this is an example of one of the 300 research guides we've got. This is on the subject of emigration. We have other research guides on passports and ships passenger lists and researching British colonies and dominions but the emigration uh, research guide is probably a really good one to start off with. And if you want to take it further, the National Archives have produced a number of books on various subjects, but we have three to do with migration records, uh, and one of which relates to the child migration I mentioned earlier. So let's start off with looking at those government records which were created to enable people to travel overseas. So I'm sure we're all familiar with passports. So the earliest passport registers start at around 1795 and we have passport records going right up to the end of the Second World War. So we'll talk about those in a moment. But prior to passports you had a, a mixture of records known as warrants and passes or licenses to pass beyond the seas. And these were issued mainly for Europe but also for the Americas. Um, and what we, the government really wanted was people to um, give their oaths of allegiance to uh, the UK uh, to enable them to travel beyond the seas. So 
So there are various forms of documentation which we'll, we'll have a look at, uh, which come under this broad banner. There are also some case papers, so some applications of passports, but these relatively small number, they, they probably represent a few hundred cases from the hundreds of thousands of passports which were issued at the start of the 20th century. So this is an example of a pretty early uh, register of people intending to travel. So what we have here is that these people are signing their oath of allegiance to the Crown. Uh, this particular one are registered of passports leaving the Port of London for New England and other colonies, and it's around about uh, the early part of the 17th century. These records haven't been digitised, they're in the series E157, E stands for the Exchequer, uh, but a lot of the information has been transcribed and put in published works so uh, there are published works by J.C. Hotton uh, listing all those persons who registered for licenses to travel beyond the seas from 1600 to 1700. This particular one is from 1634. And here you've got a later example. This is actually uh, an, a register of passports. Now these passports, I think this particular one is from 1876. It's important to note that passports weren't compulsory until the First World War in 1915 when espionage was at fairly high levels. Uh, it's also important to recognise that the information within the passport registers and also the indexes to them is fairly limited. So as this example shows you, uh, it indicates the date the passport was issued, the number of the passport, then the name of the individual, sometimes you'll get their full name, but here we've got an example where only the initial of the full name is mentioned. And then you'll get the destination. Continent will indicate Europe, but sometimes you'll have a specific place, as the example on the screen shows, we have one for Rome. And then you'll get another column which indicates the person who would have recommended the individual for a passport usually someone respected the local community so it could be a parish priest or a teacher or a justice of the peace etc so the number at the far right hand column uh, just indicates the cost of that passport for this period of time passports were issued for single journeys it wasn't until 1968 that our 10-year passport that we're all familiar with now was introduced so i'm sure you can appreciate there were hundreds and thousands uh, of these uh, issued uh, from the 17th, 18th century right up to 1948, which is the latest uh, passport information we have. Here's a later one. I think this one goes to 1930. The information is typed, but there's actually less information. They've got rid of the um, column where it was the person who uh, recommended the applicant uh, was, so that, that's now disappeared. So the information is even even less rich, so it's purely the name and the destination. The continent has been replaced by the word Europe, and you'll see that the price increased to seven shillings and sixpence. So in terms of using these records, the indexes to them have been digitized, so you can search by name. The indexes actually provide very similar information to the registers that we've just seen. Unfortunately, the indexes don't survive for the whole period, so there is no name index for the periods 1795 to 1850, 1857, 1863 to 73, and 1904 right up to 1948. For that period, you really have to plough yourselves through the registers themselves in FO611. Uh, FO indicates the Foreign Office series. So it's quite hard work, uh, but it's useful to know that the registers are arranged chronologically by date of issue. And this is an example of uh, an application for a passport. These are representative samples. They're in the series FO737. It's probably around about 100, maybe 200. Uh, but that's a very, very small sample. But they're quite illustrative. So here we have an early photograph of a passport issued in 1920 and obviously 
on the record with indications about where the person intended to travel, uh, a physical description of them, uh, and all the, also a photograph. Um, it's just a shame that very few have survived, but those that have survived can be searched by name. So moving on to departure records, we have some very early departure records in an Exchequer series of E190. These were compiled as a result of an Exchequer order in 1564, requiring all custom officials in ports of England and Wales to make their entries describing goods and duties payable. Then we have early registers of passengers in Colonial Office series C01. These primarily relate the early uh, voyages to America and they're very similar to the Oath of Allegiance documents we saw earlier. And then towards the end of British rule in America, between 1773 and 1776, there were treasury registers of passengers created, which we can look at. And then you've got a couple of series of Board of Trade uh, series. So one relates to births, marriages, and deaths at sea of those on board. So that could be crew or passengers. Uh, and then from 1890, we have the more standard passenger lists running right through to 1960. So we'll look at some of these examples. Here's a very early Exchequer uh, port book entry in E190. So you really do have a list of the goods that are being uh, traded, uh, where customs is payable. But they do include the names of merchants travelling with the goods, uh, and some of these people would be emigrants, uh, either short term or long term. There are no name indexes, so again, they're arranged chronologically, but they do uh, contain some details of those early emigrants we talked about before. And here's an example of the Colonial Office Series 1. This relates to some of those early emigrants traveling to America. So this is a group of people traveling to New England. So very similar to the Oath of Allegiance records. You tend to get names, the ship they're traveling on, where they're traveling from and to, the date, uh, so this is 1634, and the ages of the passengers. So they will include children as well, as this example shows. I mentioned a series of records T47, which relate to those emigrants travelling to America between 1773 and 1776, just before the American War of Independence. These are very rich in terms of details. They will include age, occupation, the last place of residence in the UK, the date uh, of departure, destination, ships' names, the reason for living, uh, leaving. Uh, so they are quite detailed, but it's a very short-lived register, only four years. This collection, along with some of the ones I've just mentioned, are due to be digitised fully and name searchable over the next year or so. So do watch the space at the National Archives website to learn more about that. Until then, the records by and large are available in their original uh, format here at Kew, and there are some traditional ways of uh, entry to them, such as a passenger, such as a card index which you can see in front of you. So the card index will take you straight to the register. And there's an example in front of you from William Cybery, who was a 17-year-old weaver who migrated to the Americas in the 1770s. I talked to you about the Board of Trade. Now, their records begin around about 1854. Uh, they really start off with a collection of births, marriages, and deaths of people on board merchant vessels, uh, many of whom would be emigrants traveling to their new destination and new life. Before the age of steam, uh, it was quite dangerous to travel uh, by ship, particularly for such long voyages to America and also Australasia. Uh, disease was rife, particularly in the more cramped accommodation such as steerage and third class. Uh, so quite a number would actually die on those journeys. So you can find out details of those people who unfortunately didn't make the uh, journey. Uh, this is one of the notable examples uh, with the Titanic, of course, which didn't reach its final destination uh, with having uh, collided with an iceberg. 
1912. So we do have a list of all those people who perished. All these records uh, are now available to search by name online through bmbregisters.co.uk with which the National Archives have teamed together to make the records available. So you can search by name from 1854 right up to the 1970s. The Board of Trade were also responsible for collating records of people migrating to and from the British Isles. And we have these records from 1890 right through to 1960. These have been digitised, but there's just a few examples of them in front of you. So the records are arranged by port of departure, uh, and you have lists of British passengers, and then you have separate lists of alien passengers and later Commonwealth passengers. So some of the early records from the 1890s will have fairly scant information. So we'll have the names, we'll have the nationality, and we'll have whether they're an adult or whether they are a minor. And here we have uh, a list of some of those early acting troops going to America when Hollywood was being set up. So this, I think, is from 1910. And there is Charlie Chaplin. And then you've also got Stanley Jefferson, who became known as Stan Laurel. And then you also have other people in that acting troupe. The later passenger list, this one is from around about 1920. This is actually 16-year-old Cary Grant, or then as he was known, Archibald Leach, uh, going from Bristol out again to Hollywood to be, begin his Hollywood career. So a little bit more details, you tend to get an age field um, and you get an indication of who else he was travelling with. And then the 1930s, you get an address field. The address field is the address in the UK. So it's either the last known address or the address that they were staying to if they were moving back to the UK. And there's Stan Laurel. Of course, not all these records relate to migrants. Uh, because they be, they relate also to merchants, uh, you know, carrying out uh, and dealing with their merchandise, setting up business overseas, etc. And from the 1920s, an awful lot will relate to tourists. So we think between 1890 and 1960, there's probably around records relating to 30 to 35 million people, but many of these people will be recorded on many occasions, depending on what their job was. As I said, there are separate lists for alien passengers. Some of the lists have been scored through, the names have been scored through. I mean, that could be an indication that they, they never actually travelled, but they were they were due to travel. That particular list was, was from 1939, just before the outbreak of war. And as I said, the lists go right up to, to 1960. All of these lists are now available to download. Uh, through Find My Past in collaboration with the National Archives. And you can search by name, by name of ship, uh, by name of port of departure from 1890 to 1960. The collection does stop in 1960. Uh, travel by air became much more common and the National Archives uh, has not uh, accessioned records of passengers by air. So the collection does come to an end in 1960. Okay, moving on to free migration records. So I mentioned earlier that the government was active in fostering and encouraging people to migrate to the colonies and dominions in the 19th and early 20th century. And there are two reasons for this. They're known as the push and pull reasons. So there was a reason to push people away from the UK, and this tended to be because of the dire economic circumstances during the mid part of the 19th century, particularly in rural areas, uh, rural employment declined rapidly as in industrialization uh, took pace. Uh, there was also other reasons, uh, such as the potato famine in Ireland. Potato famines occurred for a number of years, but particularly in 1820s and 1830s and 40s. Uh, so people were really thrown into poverty and destitution. On the other hand, there was a need for these people to provide manpower uh, and work uh, in the colonies and dominions which were being set up. 
So we'd had movements from Ireland, Scotland, Wales and England, particularly from rural areas, to Canada um, and later to Australia and New Zealand. So the Commission uh, you know, tried to pull this information together uh, and they tried to encourage people as much as possible to start a new life overseas. And they do that by offering incentives, so things like free passages, uh, land grants at a reduced rate. So this is one example where somebody migrated to Upper Canada in Ramsey from 1824 and he came from Ireland and he's really writing back to his family and his friends to say that he made a really good decision, uh, you know, life's better for him in the hope that his friends and his family would come and join him. These records are in series CO386. Uh, they aren't unfortunately arranged by name, so you can't easily search for these emigrants. And it's a representative sample, so there's probably a few thousand, uh, and that's fairly small from the tens of thousands of people who would have migrated with these schemes. Um, but they're useful records, they're colourful, many are written in the hands of the, the emigrants, uh, putting forward their case to be selected. Uh, so here we have one uh, with, uh, this, is, this is a farmer I think who wants to migrate with his four daughters, uh, and they can provide support and employment uh, and help develop the, the land in Canada which they're applying to go to. And then you get another one as well. As I say, these are from across the British Isles, so you'll get cases from Ireland, but also from Scotland, England and Wales. So a lot of these people were coming from rural parts of the British Isles. And we have similar records in the Ministry of Health series MH12. These are records created by the Poor Law Act and the Poor Law Commissioners. So these people have been selected uh, to leave the parish. This parish, particular parish is in, in Suffolk, in the, in the parish of Hockering. Uh, and they're leaving for new lives in Canada. So no doubt uh, they were finding it quite tough in Hockering uh, as the rural decline took place uh, and they're going to go for what will hopefully be for them a better life in Canada. Now these records aren't indexed by name so again it's really difficult to find this information. You really have to plough your way through the records chronologically in the series MH12. That said, a small number of these records have been catalogued in some detail as part of a big project a few years ago called Living the Poor. Uh, but it's a fairly small sample of records, but the catalogue discovery will indicate which ones are searchable by name and which ones are not. But if they're not, it is a case of accessing the original records here at Kew. And then you've got another entry from a poor law record indicating the lists names, ages and details of other people migrating to Canada. The records go from around about the 1830s uh, right through to about 1911, but a lot of the later ones don't survive in great detail. So finally I was going to talk to you about child migration. So this was something fairly unique to Britain in the, in, in, in the sense that the government actively encouraged the migration of pauper children to Canada initially from the 1870s through to about 1920 and then later to Rhodesia but also Australia and New Zealand from about 1910 and right up until 1970. And they were encouraged primarily by evangelists such as Maria Rye uh, and McPherson and lately you, or later you had Dr. Bernardo. And the reason these people got involved is because children didn't particularly have a, a great time uh, during the mid part of the 19th century. Child mortality rates were incredibly high. Uh, and a lot of children were abandoned by their parents, so they fell into destitution. They lived on the street. A lot of them got involved in crime. Uh, and there was no education or compulsory education for all children until 1870. So these individuals got together and sought 
could we do something better for them? Um, and they identified that the life would be better for them in Canada, where the air was cleaner, particularly outside the urban city where a lot of these children were, were destitute. And the government initially would support them in this. And here you have children migrating from the Poplar Union. So again, this is another record from the series NH12. Unfortunately, you can't search these names on the catalogue. Uh, you just have to plough your way through the poor law records at this time. So this one is for the uh, for the parish of Poplar in London. Uh, I think it's it's from about the 1870s probably, and it's just a list of all those children who are destined for migration to Canada. Once in Canada, they would be sent to work on farms or as domestic servants uh, with, with families. And the government supported this. I mean, they did send out an inspector in the 1870s to have a look at how the children were being uh, treated. And this report, which did actually get published, is available in an MH series, MH19. Uh, and it goes into some great de detail about some of those early children who migrated out uh, with some of the institutions such as Barnardo's. The report was quite damning in the sense that there was evidence that the children were abused, uh, either physically or mentally, uh, and they didn't believe the welfare of the child was taken into account. So the authorities had to change the way that they managed uh, the migration of children in order for the government to continue to support it. Uh, but eventually it did continue to support it, and as I say, the records did go right up to 1970. And of course, this is very much in the public eye at the moment, as a lot of these records are being used to help the inquiry, uh, which is actually being carried out into the welfare of children and records in the 19th and 20th century. This is a, a rare case, case study that survives. These are two sisters who were found destitute um, in... London in 1907. So uh, they were destitute and begging. Uh, so the children were taken into care. And subsequently, it was identified that they were neglected by their father, who was in, in and out of prison, as this record tells us. The children went to Barkingside at Dr. Bernardo's. Uh, and then the father was written to, and it was explained quite clearly that the children were being prepared to be sent to Canada. He wrote back to the authorities uh, explaining that he wasn't happy with this and that it would be unlikely that he'd see his children again. But I'm afraid that fell on deaf ears and the children did actually leave and their details are included on those passenger lists I meant earlier, mentioned earlier between 1890 and 1960. And in fact there's a very good site uh, in the National Archives of Canada website where they pull together records of child migrants and what happened to them once they reached Canada. So if you're interested in learning more about child migration, you can combine using records such as this one, which is the Outward Passenger List, where their names are recorded, to the Library and Archives in Canada who put together a database of what happened to those children when they arrived. It is highly unlikely that they saw their father again. Uh, I think the evidence shows that they remained in uh, Canada for the rest of their lives. Uh, finally, uh, there's a very other unique period of British history where the government supported the evacuation of children in the Second World War. So most children were evacuated on the 1st of September in 1939 from urban cities in the UK to rural parts of the UK. Uh, and this was under Operation Pied Piper. Uh, many of those children would stay there until the threat of invasion, and the threat of bombing in, London, in, in British cities uh, waned from about 1944 onwards. Uh, but there's a second uh, plan, and that was to send children overseas to the Dominion, particularly Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa. And this was at a time when the enemy invasion risks were at their highest. 
in May and June 1940. So they, these were known as sea, sea evacuees. Uh, and here we have a party of school children starting their new life in New Zealand. They're in a series of records D0131. Uh, and these records have been researched by name. And this is a particular document which provides some photographic evidence of those journeys. Unfortunately, it was very short lived. Over a thousand children were migrated as part of this scheme, uh, and each of them have history cards. Some of them would go to nominated uh, households, and perhaps they were uh, relations of the individuals, or some would go to unnominated ones. Uh, and some would have good uh, times, and others would have difficult times, as this particular card shows us. So you can search these records by name on Discovery. The policy came to an abrupt end when, unfortunately, one of the vessels carrying the children in 1940 was torpedoed and most of the children died. So there are only about 15 to 20 journeys uh, between June and September, and then the policy is uh, between June and September, and then the policy was abandoned. That particular tragedy we've got records of uh, relating to the individuals who died and also correspondence between their parents and the authorities about how to how to deal with, with the loss of the child. So that concludes the webinar. So obviously I'm very happy to take any questions that anyone may have.